it's an honor to be here again, amen, in uh, Calvary Apostolic Church, amen, in Denver. We, uh, uh, we got a call, actually a text from your pastor, and he asked if I could preach today. And uh, my wife, I showed it to my wife, and I said, that's a very unusual text to ask me if I can come preach on Sunday for him. This Sunday, he had given me the date. And I said, uh, huh, that's interesting. I've got a church that I pastor, and I've got a pulpit that I preach in on Sunday, and, and I'm expected to be there. And so I, I said, I need to call him and find out what's going on. Amen. That he, you know, he would want to invite me as it, it, it's something special. And what I didn't know is it was something very, very special. And uh, that was the marriage of his mother-in-law. Amen. His sister, it was Sister Ellard. Is that right? Did I get the name? Is that right? Amen. And now Sister, uh, I'll take your word for it. Amen. But uh, so when we heard that and um, I, I, told, I, I told my wife, I said, uh, I, I, let, let's pray about that. And, uh, and immediately, um, I received a mandate from the Lord to be here today. And I feel like I'm here not just because of a wedding and pastor being out of town, but I, I know that I've heard from the Lord and I have a message for this church today. And I have a message for an individual or two here today. And so I'm going to be ministering under uh, the, the unction of the Holy Ghost and I'm going to try to work as fast as I can I've been up uh, for many hours this morning trying to cut my sermon down from 17 hours to 16 hours. And that's a joke, kind of. If they're listening to it at home, everybody at home would be shaking their head going, no. So, um, but, uh, and, and Bishop knows that I enjoy preaching, and he, he said, y'all hurry up with the preliminaries because I want to give Brother Sharp enough time to work today and do what the Lord wants him to do. So I thank you for that, Bishop. It's an honor to be with you and Sister uh, Heyman again. God bless you. We love you so much. Amen. And uh, it's, so we don't feel like we're here by accident. And the vacation to Breckenridge was, was piggybacked on the ideal of coming. We had not thought to come uh, to Breckenridge. I do ski. I've been skiing since I was 15. But when I got over 250 pounds, skiing got more dangerous for me. Uh, I did spend four hours on the slope on a perfect ski day on Thursday. And I uh, tried to go back on Friday. And I only could do two hours. And then the legs said, you wait too much, buddy. Go home. And... Uh, so I went back to the condo. My wife had a wonderful time in Breck, and we thank you for sharing your beautiful state with us. Amen. It's an honor to be here. I bring you greetings from Temple Christian Center and from our church family to you today. I come to do three things today. I have three things that I need to do before I can leave. And then my wife and I are not even going to have the opportunity to stay and enjoy lunch uh, uh, because of the storm that's coming in. We're going to get out of here and try to make it through the pass before the, the, the snow keeps us in, in Colorado. My wife said she's ready to see her grandbaby, amen, and her golden retriever, amen. So uh, we're going to get out of here as soon as service is over. But I do need to do three things before I leave. I need to bring you a message from the Lord. I need to prove and secure that message in your hearts and minds in the Word of God so that it's just not a vague word or a word that is thrown out there. You need to have the Word of God always secured through uh, the message of God. A message needs to be secured through the Word. And thirdly, I want to give you an opportunity to act today on that Word before you leave this place today. A scripture the Lord gave me for our church at the beginning of this year, and I've been leading on it heavily, is Jeremiah 6, 16. This is not what I'm preaching, but I need you to understand this scripture so we can go forward. And this is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old and godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your soul. But they replied, no, that's not the road we want. So I posted watchmen over you, is what the Lord said. And this is what they said to you. Listen for the sound of the alarm. But the people replied, no, we won't pay attention. Today, we must pay attention to the preacher in our life. If we are to find the pathway to our promised land. And that's what I'm going to preach to you. That's the title and the subject that you need to take home today is the pathway to your promised land. 
This message today that I'm bringing to you is for individuals who are hungry to hear from God and to a church that is ready to see the promises that God made to this bishop 65 years ago. I pastored nowhere near as long as you have, but I know the promises God has made to me about the harvest field in which he called you into. And it is God's will for this church to see those promises come into fruition and to existence, to bring them from the, the mind of God into the reality of our world today. That is the will of God. So I'm preaching to somebody who is hungry to hear from God and to a church that is ready to receive from God the promises that have been prophesied about CAC. And I want to preach so that you can find the pathway to that promised land. My job is to help you today to find that place. Today when I talk about the promised land, I'm not talking about heaven. Heaven's a different subject and a different sermon for a different day. I'm talking to you about the promises that God has given you as an individual. A God that spoke them even before you existed. He knew who you would be. In the seed of your mother's womb, he created you, your color, your height, your, your sex, whether you're male or female. He created who you are to be. You are no mistake and you are no accident in the masterpiece in the mind of God. You are somebody that God has called for a purpose and a time such as this. So I'm talking about the promises that God has prophesied towards you and about you and about this church. And while I'm talking about these promises, you have to purpose in your mind and your heart that you want to find that purpose of God and that promise of God and that you want to find your place in God. And the promises that God has prophesied will come to pass. So this message today, I ask you to stand one more time and I ask you to hear the message that the Lord gave me immediately when I agreed to come. And I received the mandate from God and the invitation from your pastor. These are the two messages that the Lord told me to speak to this church. I'm going to declare them, and then I'm going to show you them in the Word of God. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity to act on these two words. Each person must follow the path provided in the Word of God if you are to find the promises of God for your life. I'm speaking to you as an individual. Each individual must follow the path provided in the word of God if you are to receive the promises of God. It is possible that you've received a promise that has not come to place because you have not followed the path that has been provided in the word of God. I will prove that to you in just a moment through the word of God. And the second word this church must follow the man of God if it's going to find its way to the promises of God. I ask you to join me right now in prayer as we go to the Lord together. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to open the hearts and the minds of every hearer in this house. You promised us that you would be with us when we came together in your name. And we have lifted your name today in this house. And I feel your presence near me now. And I know your word is certain in my heart, in my mind. Give me the ability, give me the strength, God, to deliver what you've placed in my heart to your precious people in this house today that we can both hear and know the word and the mind of God. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You may be seated. The message to the individual in this place today. Perhaps someone wandered into this house for the first time and you are lost in life and you don't know up from down and you are looking for your purpose and you are looking for your place in life. I would submit to you that you're not here by accident, but I would say to you that God has heard your cries in the midnight hour, and he has set a path before you that you certainly would be able to find your place and your purpose in, in life. 
Each person, though, must follow the path provided in the word of God. And for every person, God has provided a promise, a purpose, and a place. For every person that's hearing this, God has a promise for you. He has a purpose for you, and he has a place for you to serve him. Your promise set was given to you first by Jesus when he described it and explained it to his disciples. And I'm, I'm going to try to move quickly and not refer to every scripture to get it down to 16 hours from 17. But Jesus said, I won't leave you comfortless. He said, I've got to go away. You go home and do your homework. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it. It'll pop up in your Bible. I, 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 I've got to go away, but I won't leave you comfortless. But I'm going to send the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Ghost. And that when the Holy Ghost comes on you and comes in you, it's going to do something supernatural beyond what you can do, beyond your abilities, beyond your nature, beyond your desires. There is a promise for you that when you receive it from God, evidenced by speaking in an unknown tongue as the Spirit begins to fill you, when you receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise of God, you will receive power like never before. Preach. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost with the other apostles. He said, this promise is unto you, it's unto your children, and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God should call. So we know that this promise is ours because we are those who were afar off. This promise, when it comes, brings supernatural power. I like Facebook because it has memories and it popped up some memories of a sermon I preached about five years ago. There are superheroes, or I preached, uh, excuse me, the title of the message was Superheroes Are Real. And the truth of the matter is you filled with the power of the Holy Ghost are a superhero. I don't know if you believe that or not, but you need to. That when the Holy Ghost fills you, you will have power to do things uh, that are beyond your human ability. You will have power to lay hands on the sick. And the sick will recover. You will have power to speak to the devils and say, get out of my way, and it will get out of your way. You will have power through the Holy Ghost to when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, the promise of the Father, when you are filled with it, to say to your problem, mountain, be thou removed uh, and cast into yonder sea. Uh, you will have problem to, power to overcome your problems, to endure your trials, and to perform the plan that God has prepared for your your life and that plan is that you might be a witness to his power that you used to be one way and now you're another way you used to act like this and now you act like that and people look at you and say what happened to you how did you change how were you delivered how did you get over that how did you get through that and you would say what the writer of the Old Testament said oh it's not me but it is Christ in me, uh, the hope of glory, and it's for you today. That promise is for you today, that you might be a witness of his power, and that the glory that is seen in your life, I don't have time to stop, but I would preach on the glory that you can do. There are glorious things you can do with your life, but the glory should be given to God and not man, because it is not I that does it. I am not here because of myself, but I'm here by the saving grace and the power of the Holy Ghost. I don't preach to you with enticing words of man's wisdom or education or any intellect, but I come to you with a demonstration and the power of the Spirit and the Holy Ghost. Amen. That while I preach to you that your life can be changed, uh, your life can be redirected, and your life can be altered eternally by salvation with Jesus Christ. So you have a promise and you have a purpose. If you're here as an individual, if you will follow the pathway, amen, of the promise, 
you will find your purpose. After Jesus comes on to into your life through the Holy Ghost and through his Holy Spirit, you will receive power to be a witness. Paul says, I don't come with enticing words, but I come with demonstration of power and spirit. You are not an accident. You are not here today by accident. The Bible said the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord or, 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 or controlled or, or, or directed by the Lord. And if you're in this place, that's enough righteousness to get saved. That's enough faith to have God change your life. If you had enough fortitude to get up and put clothes on and find your way into this building or online, I'm here to tell you, you've got enough faith to believe that the Holy Spirit of God can fill you before you leave and your life can be eternally altered and eternally changed. You are not here by accident. You're not listening by accident. You didn't show up by accident. But God has directed and ordered your steps. You are indeed God's masterpiece. If I had time to preach, I'd say it doesn't matter what color, what shape, what size, how wealthy you are, how educated you are, you are not. You are still a divine creation of God. It doesn't matter if you know your mama or your daddy, if you're an orphan or you're an aristocrat. You are still a divine masterpiece of God. And not only are you a masterpiece, uh, you are a part of God's master plan. I would submit to you as I preach in a hurry, amen, that you are not even your own you were not built for yourself though you were born of woman you were not of that woman but you were born for God whether you've discovered that or not Paul would tell that Corinthian church don't you know it that your body is the temple of the spirit the Holy Spirit that within you you have God living in you. You are created to be a vessel of the most high God. That is why you came into existence. You didn't come here to run a business. You didn't come here to work down the street. You didn't come here just to go skiing or do this or that. You came here to be a vessel of the most high God. He said, you are not your own because you've been bought with a price before you were born. He died for you and paid a price for you. If you're wandering and lost in this place today, your life's turned upside down and you don't know what your purpose or your place is, I'm here to tell you, you need to find Jesus. You need to understand that he knows exactly what he has for you and he has promises for you that you can't even imagine. There is a destiny that he has laid down. But if you were to find that eternal destiny, you were to follow the path that God has set before you. He also went on to say that we have a purpose, and that purpose, and, and I have time, don't have time, but go home and Google it. First Corinthians chapter 12. He talks about uh, uh, special abilities and spiritual gifts, and, and it, he doesn't want them to didn't misunderstand it. The Corinthians kind of got all messed up with that kind of stuff, and they, they got too wound up, and they were coming and mixing paganism and Christianity, and it, it was a mess. And, and he said, but the, he said, I, I want to clear the air. There are different spiritual gifts, and the, and the Holy Spirit gives them to each and every one of us. And he said, the same Spirit is the source of them all, speaking of the power and the plan and the purpose of God. He said, there are different kinds of service, but we all serve the same Lord. The God who works in different ways. But it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Now, I'm talking about your purpose. Verse number 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. If you came into this place lost, can I tell you that you have a promise of the power of the Holy Ghost. And with that power comes the spiritual gifts that God created for you as an individual. The person sitting beside you does not have the same gift that you have. Your husband does not have the same gift that you have. Your wife does not have the same gift that you have. But the gift that God created in you is for you so that you can serve humanity. He concludes that passage in the 11th verse where he continues one or the other. And, and it, it says this, and it is the one and only spirit who distributes all of these gifts. You need to stop and check yourself. And you need to just say to yourself, God's made me unique. Say it with me. God's made me unique. He's giving me gifts. He's given me talents that are unique to me 
for a divine purpose that they are mine and mine alone but they were not given for me to me just to possess them they were given to me to serve others uh, to reach out and to heal and to help and to deliver and to be a voice in a lost and dying world he alone decides which gift each person should have finally your place if you're an individual here today and you have not received the promise which is the Holy Ghost then you have not been able to fulfill your purpose or find your place but even if you have been filled with the Holy Ghost and you've not found your purpose now you see you were created with a purpose but you need to find a place Paul would tell that Corinthian church in the 12th chapter he said the human body has many parts and many parts make up one whole body so it is with the body of Christ you are to supply each other's needs the Bible said you are uh, joined together you are fitly framed together I could go on and on and on about the body of Christ but when you're not here or you're not in your place then the body of Christ suffers when you are not doing what God made you to do then then the body of Christ is lacking so God created you with a purpose and he set you in the body in a place that you can serve and you can pour out of the gifts that God gave you he said in the 18th verse and I'm skipping a bunch but uh, he said our bodies have been made many parts but God has put each part just where he wants it I have to remind myself of that when I try to do what your bishop did today sing I love to sing I'm just not very good at it and and I've studied singing and I listen to a lot of music but oh I wished I had your voice I wished I had that deep is that baritone is that what that I don't know what that and got, got up and whoa man I have had episodes in the shower that I know I sounded just like you I just can't bring them out here and the more I try it out here the more I keep reminding and my wife certainly reminds me that that's not where God puts you in the body that's not your place your place is a preacher and so when I get trying to sing in a sermon and I'll get I'll get lost in preaching sometime and I'll do exactly what you did makes the musicians a nervous wreck I mean I can sing in three keys all of them at the same time and they and they go nuts I mean when I try to do what you did today they go bananas and and, and I can hear my wife just saying just preach honey just preach just preach you see we've all been set in a place to do what we are uniquely made to do whether it's stand on a platform or to stand at the front door whether it's to mow the yard or to pay the bills whether it's to talk to the homeless on the street corner or to give to an offering that can feed the homeless each one of us has a place in, a, in God's plan that he has set us in the body to serve and it is all of us together that make up the body of Christ each one of us are a part of it he went on to say in that 28th verse for some are apostles some are prophets some are teachers some do miracles some have the gift of healing some can help others some can take the gift of leadership some uh, know how to uh, speak in an unknown tongue and others interpret the unknown tongue but each one of us has generously by the promise of the father which is the infilling And not only a gift, a purpose to you, and a place which is the church of God to organize that body and to become what God wants us to be. So if you're in this place today and you're lost and you're alone and you have no purpose and you have no place, you have come to the right place. And before you leave here today, you can act on what I've just preached about. And you can find what you've been looking for which is the infilling of the Holy Ghost. It is the greatest gift ever given to man. And you can find your purpose through the power of the Holy Ghost, and you can find your place through the CAC, Calvary Apostolic Church. God has given us each one special gifts. Now I move to the message for this church. I've been preaching fast to get to this point. And just as God has placed his body, you in his body, 
and he has given you the promise and he has given you a purpose and he has given you a place. He has also placed the man of God in your life. 65 years ago, this young man and this young woman started this church as the man of God for this hour and the hour that God called them. And for 50 years, he labored. Now, even 65 years, he sees the promises of God that God gave him when he was young, when he was naive, and he didn't have gray hair and didn't have what he has now. But God gave every pastor and every bishop and every leader that he sets over a church he gives them a vision and a plan and he said follow this pathway and lead my people to the promises that i have prepared for this church you told me about the first building and the second building this morning i love the stories and then this building and that how each one of those not only came from a dream and a promise in your heart but came into fruition and were paid for by the and it was a, a, a debt-free project can i tell you that does not happen naturally but that happens supernaturally as people follow the man of god as he leads them on the pathway to the promises of God. Paul would tell the Ephesian church in chapter 4, now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. It's their responsibility to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church in, and the body of Christ. In other words, they are the leaders in pointing us to the pathway to the promises that God has prepared for this church. In this world, and this is the word that God has given me, excuse me, today for this church. CAC, listen to me as your friend and someone who loves this church dearly. You must always follow the man of God that he has placed over you in your life, you must submit to them that rule over you, for they watch for your soul, and they have a purpose also. Their purpose is to build you and to lead you into the promises of God. The Old Testament is given to us for an example, the Bible says. It's not just in the archaic uh, places of our mind. It's not just in the history books or the dusty part of the Bible. But it is the footing on which we find Christianity today. We are not just a Christian church, but we are a Judeo-Christian church. We stand firmly on the Jewish faith and the Jewish history. I personally believe through faith, Abraham was my father. I hope you do too. And so the stories of the Old Testament are not accidental or incidental, but they are left there for examples, the Bible says, for us, the New Testament church. So I'm going to lean heavily to support the message that I just brought to you and the mandate I come here with that you must follow the man of God if you're going to find the promises of God. I'm going to lean heavily on the story of uh, uh, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt into the promised land. Don't ever mistake that the promised land was heaven. There were giants in the promised land. There was sin in the promised land. There was all kinds of problem when they got there. It's not a type of heaven. It's a type of living in the promises of God. It's a type of living in the place where God wants us to live. In the blessings of God. In houses we don't deserve. Drinking from wells we didn't dig. Eating from vineyards we didn't plant. It's where God wants us to live. It's the place that God had prepared each for each of us. There's a place like that for you. And there's a place like that for this church in this community. And so we're going to look at that journey that Israel took from Egypt to the promised land. The first 40 years of that journey were led by Moses. And the last 30 years of that journey were led by Joshua. 
Moses was a unique character in the Bible. You know the story. He was saved by the hand of God and a wise mother who put him in a basket. Pharaoh's daughter got him. He was raised and educated in the house of Pharaoh. But his mother was there as his wet nurse to always teach him and tell him that you are not an Egyptian, you're a Hebrew. And at the proper time, he felt that calling and that unction of God, and he responded to it, not correctly and not properly. I'm glad recordings of my first sermon don't exist. Moses made a mess of it. He felt his calling. He felt his place, and he got up and he said, I'm going to lead these people. So he killed an Egyptian. Not a great start to his pastoral leadership. Not a great moment. As a matter of fact, it scared the people so much that they rejected him. And he ran away and had to hide in the wilderness. He didn't uh, do it the right way always. He, like I said, he, he made some mistakes. But while he made his mistakes and he repented for them, he had an epiphany. He had an epiphany at a burning bush. Moses saw this bush burning that wasn't consumed, and he had enough of a heart of God and remembered his place in God that he responded to it, and he heard the voice of God, and he did what God said. Now, he made some deals with God. He said, I can't do it by myself. I stammer and stutter, and I don't have all the knowledge, so God gave him a helper. God gave him Aaron to help him to get through this, but he had set him apart. He had this vision, this epiphany, this God in a uh, manifest form come speak to him and tell him that this is what you are to do. And that is no doubt what it sounded like when your bishop came to this city. I don't know how the voice came to you. Maybe we'll have a cup of coffee and discuss that sometime. But I can tell you, you do not stay in a place for 65 years uh, without a divine mandate from God and hearing from God and having an epiphany and having a burning bush experience where God says, do this and I will do that. By Aaron and Moses' hand, Aaron's help, He oversaw the plagues that would release God's people from Egypt. And you know them, and I don't have time to preach them. But there, those plagues came. And and, 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 and then finally, uh, the heart heart of Pharaoh was softened by God. and, 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 And so he lets the people go. And so they take all the gold and the silver, and they spoil Egypt. And they head out into the wilderness to worship, is what the Bible said. And then God causes again the heart of of uh, Moses to, uh, I mean, of Pharaoh to be hardened, and he chases after uh, uh, the children of Israel. Can can you imagine uh, the, the 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 feeling it must have been that this pastor, if you will, in the wilderness is leading all these people? They just had their biggest moment. They've got gold and silver, and and they're dancing and they're singing in the wilderness, and there comes a dust cloud on the horizon. And some of the guards in the rear guard say, oh, my God, it's Pharaoh and all of his chariots, and they're coming after us, and and they're going to get us, and and all of that. What? I thought, I thought. And we've done all we can do. He begins to do what he can do. And a pillar of fire, the Bible said, was in the night. And a cloud to lead them and to cover them by the day. So that the Egyptians could not come nigh them. I don't know how many times the fire has fallen. And the cloud has covered this congregation. But I would assume it's been many and innumerable over the years. That the pillar of God, the fire of God just led this church and just and, and just the cloud of God just covered it and, and kept it and all through that. You see, because there's a man of God that is pursuing the plan of God and the purpose of God and the place that God would lead his people. Moses says, hang on. He has a prayer meeting and the Lord tells him what to do. And I wish I had, I like to illustrate messages that keeps you involved. Uh, So I'll just clap my hands and pretend that's an illustration. He stretches forth a rod over the Red Sea. He prays a prayer in front of the people and steals the people and said, God's going to take care of us. And he goes and he lays down and goes to bed because he's already spoke to God. He's heard from God. And he has faith in the prayer that he prayed. 
And the Bible said while they slept that the east winds began to blow. And they blew all night long. And they took that Red Sea and they walled up walls of water on each side. So that the next day when they walked out of their tents, they saw the provision, the plan of God as plain as day. Where there was water before, now there's dry ground. And Moses leads a singing and rejoicing people to towards their promises or the promised land of God on the other side. And they sing and they celebrate Egypt follows them down. Pharaoh's chariots and horses follow them into the waters only to be consumed when their wheels fall off and are clogged and the waters overtake them and they sing with joy. This enemy you see today, you will see no more forever. Victory is in the house and victory comes. He crossed the Red Sea in the way that God had led him. The people that Moses led would be different than they would be later on when Joshua would be their leader. He led people towards the promised land that had been born in Egypt. And they longed for the things of Egypt. They often complained and murmured about the food and the way they had to dress and where they could go and what they couldn't do. And why don't we go here and why don't we go there and why does pastor think we shouldn't do this and why shouldn't we do that? And they murmured continually against the man of God. He brought them to the waters, and the water wasn't sweet enough, and it was bitter waters at Merah. And so there he prays, and the Lord gives him a stick, and he performs by the supernatural power of God. He throws a stick in the water, and the water becomes sweet, and, and they drink of the water, and provision is given. I'm talking to you about following the pathway to your promised land as a church. And the man of God says, do what I said. It seems weird. It seems strange. You may never do it again. It may never work like this again. But they believed. And because they believed and because he obeyed, they drank the sweet waters that were once bitter. Their food source ran out. And they complained that they didn't have anything to eat. You know the story. So manna falls from heaven tastes like sweet like honey the Bible says it was like eating fresh hot bread every morning they just had to collect it and cook it and when they got tired of that provision of God and they murmured again because they were born in Egypt and they longed for Egypt and the onions and the food and the, the way of life of Egypt and we're in here in the wilderness and all of those things he said hang on and he prayed and he said God has heard your complaint and he gave them quail he gave them so much money that they almost didn't I mean excuse me quail that it came out of their nose they threw it up it's possible to beg God for blessings that you are not big enough to contain and they murmured he said just keep following me well what about the water what are we going to do and so Moses goes to prayer again, speaks to God, and God says, go to the rock and strike the rock. Talk to the rock one place, strike the rock another place. And he tells him to strike it first, and he says, speak over the rock. And out of that rock, the Bible said, came sweet water. And everywhere they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, the Bible said that rock followed them. And it was their Christ, their Savior, that water that followed them. These are people, the Bible, who said their shoes did not wear out. So that meant as they got older, their shoes grew with them. Their clothes did not wear out. As they got fatter, they grew with them. They didn't, can, you, can you imagine how blessed we are? I drove up here in my BMW and I got another one in the garage. I live in a house I don't deserve. I've got money in the bank that I can't explain. I'm going to tell you, we pray the same prayer you prayed. I was in the insurance business years ago, 25 years ago. I got a, we, we pray that same prayer over our offering. I got a thing in the mail the other day that says, uh, we think we have some money for you. And I'm like, I'm going to open that one and read that in a hurry. They said, we have $41,280-something for you. That when you were in the insurance business, we owed you this money. We've owed it to you all these years. We've just been trying to catch up with you to give it to you. I'm telling you, we've got a God that knows how to bless us beyond measure, beyond comprehension. 
I could go on and on and on. When you get on the pathway that you're supposed to be on, you're living in the promises, stuff like your shoes not wearing out, your clothes not wearing out, food falling from heaven, becomes a way of life on the pathway and living in the promises of God. Is there pain? Is there sorrow? Is there suffering? Yes, this isn't heaven. This is just the pathway to the promises of God. Everything's not perfect, but you still have the promises of God. And when you are fulfilling the purpose of God and following the plan of God, then you will find your place to minister where God wants you to minister. I could go on about the defeat of the Amalekites, the first place we see Joshua mentioned. He sends Joshua down and he fights the Amalekites. You know the story. As long as his hands were up, they had victory. Aaron under one arm, her under the other. Victory came. The Amalekites were utterly destroyed by the army of Joshua that he had sent out. And then we see Moses begin to pastor the people. In Exodus 18, he organizes. In Exodus 19, he consecrates. In Exodus 20, he gives them the commitment to serve the Lord. In Exodus 21 through 22, he gives them the law. In Exodus 23, he gives them the promise, and God gives him a promise. See, I'm sending an angel before you. Exodus 23, verse 20, to protect you on your journey and to lead you safely to the place that I have prepared for you. I'm preaching to this church. I have a mandate, not from your pastor, but from God to say what I'm saying to you today. I, he, I, he said, pay close attention to him. Obey him in his instructions. Do not rebel against him, for he is my representative, speaking of the leader Moses. And he will, and he will not forgive your rebellion. But if you are careful to obey him, to follow all of my instructions. When I will be with you, uh, then I'll be with you, uh, excuse me, then will I, then I will be an enemy. If you're not careful, then I'll be your enemy. Excuse me, I'm in a liberal translation here. And I will oppose those who oppose you. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and all those otherites, amen, that you may live there. I will destroy them completely. This is the promises of God to his church when you are in the plan of God and you're following the purpose of God. But you must not worship other gods of these nations or serve them in any way or imitate their evil practices. Instead, you must utterly destroy them and smash their sacred pillars. You must serve only the Lord your God. And if you do... I will bless you with food and water, and I will protect you from illness, and there will be no miscarriages or infertility in your land, and I will give you long and full lives. I will send my terror ahead of you and create a panic among all the people whose land you will invade. I will make your enemies turn and run. I will send, I'm talking about the promises of God for this church. Uh, it's there for you. They are not all. You haven't seen it all. You haven't received it all, but it's there. He said, I'll make your enemies run. I'll drive them out. Not in a single year because it would be desolate and wild animals would multiply, so on and so forth. He said, just don't make any treaties with them or their gods. Don't look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, walk like the world, be the world. Don't join them. Don't worship at their idols. Don't fall victim to what they fall victim to. You're walking a different path. You're following after a man of God who's following after a plan of God who's firmly found his place in the word of God. You must not live in their, live in your land. Let them live in your land. They will cause you to sin against me and serve other gods. He teaches them in Exodus 25 to sacrifice like you taught these people to sacrifice to build the house of the Lord. He teaches them to give so that the tabernacle can be built and the Ark of the Covenant can be built. He gives them, God gives him the plans for that tabernacle in Exodus 26 through 31. He has to rebuke them. A terrible day in the life of Moses, their man of God. When he comes down from a prayer meeting, you cannot imagine what it feels like, unless you're a pastor, to preach your very best on a Sunday. And on the way home, to get a phone call from one of your stalwart families in your church saying that they're getting a divorce. Moments ago, they sat on the pew and heard the voice of God. You've been 
in high places with God. You've touched the throne of God. You've heard the word of God. You've felt the plan of God. You've even got the commandments of God in your hand. But when you come down from the mountain, reality sounds like them dancing naked around a golden calf, worshiping at the gods of this world. Sounds like victory, but really it's just utter chaos as they are confused and lost because their leader has spent a day or two on a mountain with God, and when he comes down, he finds them all freaked out and doing some strange stuff, so he has to rebuke them. How hard do you think that is to stand into a pulpit and to rebuke a church and a people, to shut the doors of an office and to look into the face of a family and say you're out of the will of God, and if you continue down that path, it's going the ground's going to open up and swallow you like the Korites, and if you don't listen to me, it's not fun to be that guy it's not great to be that guy oh we'd rather be the Moses on the mountaintop than the guy at the bottom who's having to say you ground that thing up and you eat it you swallow every bite of what you created your kids are gonna hate you your husband's gonna hate you your wife's gonna hate you because of the infidelity and all the other chaos that you've caused and confused because you got off of the pathway of the promises of God because you quit listening to the man of God because you looked uh, at the gods of this world instead of the one true God he rebukes them over the golden calf overcomes an insurrection by church leaders and then he intercedes for God not to destroy the people in Exodus chapter 32 the people that tried to destroy him he goes to his face and prays he said God just cause they hate me I can't hate them because they don't like me and they talk about me and my family and my kids. I'm not going to hate them, but I'm going to get on my face before God and say, God, don't bring them out here in the wilderness for them to die. Don't let them be blessed just so they can be a mess. Don't let them just have their worlds come crumbling down for nothing. Exodus 33, God renews his promise to the land of the promised land and consecrates his people. He leads them in consecration. He said, you got to set yourself apart. You can't be like the others. He tells them how to live. He tells them how to act with each other. It becomes the law of Moses. And the Lord reaffirms, I don't have time. Go home and read Exodus 33. The Lord says to Moses, get up going. Go get the people that you brought from the land of Egypt. Get going to the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he told them, I'll give you this land to your descendants. And, I'll get, and he said, I'll send an angel before you. He goes over it again. And when the people heard this, and he said, tell them, make sure they don't uh, 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 become stubborn and stiff-necked and rebellious. And if they do, I will destroy them along the way. And the people heard these stern words and they went into mourning and they stopped up their ears and they took off their worldly clothes and the worldly things for the Lord had told Moses to tell them you're a stubborn and rebellious people who are to travel. And if I were to travel with you, the Lord speaking, he said you're stubborn and rebellious. If I were to travel with you just a moment, I would destroy you. So clean yourself up. Act right. And so they left Mount Sinai in Israel and they had no more jewelry and fine clothing upon them. And as it was Moses' practice, now watch where we're going, to take the, to the tent of the meeting. And there it was set up in the distance from the camp. And everyone who wanted to make a request to the Lord would go to the tent of the meeting and stand outside of the camp. But whenever Moses went to the tent of the meeting, all of the people would get up and stand in the entrances of their own tent. And they would watch what Moses was doing until he disappeared. They were looking for leadership as he went into the tent. And the pillar of cloud would come down and hover. I'm telling you, this stuff is left in your Bible for a reason. The pastor, the leader is just a man. And he, until he enters into the cloud of God. And all of a sudden, then he becomes the man of God. Oh, Moses with all of his issues, and he's got some. Still is the man of God, and he enters into the presence of God. And so the cloud comes down, and, 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 and it hovers over. The people would stand in their entrance. And, and, they, and when he went in to the tent of the meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And afterward, Moses would return to the camp. But the young man who assisted him, Joshua, the son of Nun, would often remain behind in the tent of the meeting in the presence of the Lord. Why? Because he's learning from the bishop. Because he's learning from Moses 
how to be the man of God in the next 30 years after Moses has 40 years because everything he learned, he learned from Moses. Not from none, not his father, but he learned from the man of God. So Moses sees the glory cloud and goes to the mountain and talks with God. And he builds the tabernacle of God in Exodus 36 through 39. And he completes and dedicates the temple in Exodus 40. And they refuse to cross the Jordan. Listen to me in in Numbers 13 and 14. They murmured on the path uh, that led them to the promised land and it impeded their progress for 40 years. And God would declare in his word and would see it through to the end that no one over 20 years old would enter ever into the promised land save Joshua and Caleb. Nevertheless, All along the time they murmured, God still kept feeding them and he kept covering them and he kept leading them. I'm telling you, it's an imperfect path to the promised land. But if you'll stay in the plan of God, you will end up in the promises of God. They were always on the pathway to the promised land for the, with the provisions of the Father. They dined on blessings of manna, quail, water from the rock. Moses from time to time got angry with them, frustrated with them. And to say the least, he might have had some anger issues, had to use a little tough love, maybe overdid it a time or two. It might have cost him a thing or two in the end of his life, but his bones weren't left in the wilderness. They were rescued by the archangel and carried to a heavenly resting place. No matter which way they wandered in the wilderness, he always led them. And he was always before them. And he always had the promises for them to fulfill and come into. And then comes the transition transition of leadership from Moses to Joshua. In Deuteronomy 31, when Moses had finished giving the instructions to all the people, he said unto them, I'm now 120 years old and I'm no longer able to lead you. And the Lord has told me you will not cross the Jordan River, but the Lord, your God himself, will cross ahead of you. In other words, Moses, you're going to stay here, but they're going to go. And he will destroy the nations living there, and you will take possessions of their land. And Joshua will lead you across to the river, just just as the Lord had promised. And Joshua will lead you across the river, just as the Lord promised. I'm, 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 I'm going to read it again. You'll take possessions of their land and Joshua will lead you across the river just as the Lord promised and the Lord will destroy the nations living in the land and he destroyed all of the other kings in the wilderness and the Lord's hand will be on the people who live there and you must deal with them as I've commanded you so be strong be courageous don't be afraid don't panic before them for the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you and he will neither fail nor abandon you then Moses called for Joshua and all of the Israelites watched him and he said be strong Joshua and courageous for for you will lead these people into the land that the Lord swore swore and to their ancestors uh, swore to their ancestors that he would give them you are the one that will divide it, divide it among them as the grants of land do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord will personally go ahead of you and he will be with you and he will neither fail you nor abandon you Then in Deuteronomy 34, Moses dies. Then Moses went on Mount Nebo from which the plains of Moab and he climbed to the high peak which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the promises that he had ever shown him. Throughout Naphtali and Ephraim and Manasseh and all the land extending to the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan Valley and Jericho and the city of Palms he got to see. All of those promises, although he didn't get to do them all himself, he got to see them. And this is the land I promised on an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when he said, I will give it to your descendants. And I have now allowed you to see it with your own eyes, but you won't get to enter into it. He wasn't lost. He just didn't get to see all the promises come to fruition in his life. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. And 
the Lord buried him in the valley of near, near Beth Peor and, and Moab. And to this day, no one knows exactly where it was at, but you can read where he battled for the bones. You can read it later. And Moses was 120 years old when he died, and his eyesight was clear, and he was strong as ever. And the people of Israel mourned for Moses in the plains of Moab for all the days of his life, the customary period of mourning. And now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had endorsed him. Moses had laid his hands on him. Now Joshua was full of the spirit of wisdom because he had a PhD. Because he went to seminary. He was full of the spirit of wisdom because the old man had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him, doing just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there had never been another prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And the Lord sent him to perform all the miraculous signs and wonders of the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants in the entire land. With mighty power, Moses performed terrifying acts in the sight of all Israel. I hope they speak these words over my coffin when I die. And Joshua became the man of God for the people of Israel because he loved and lingered in the presence of the Lord and because he learned everything he could learn all of his life from Moses. But most of all, he became the man of God because Moses had put his hands on him. So Joshua begins to lead the children of the Lord. And we have those scriptures in Joshua 1 about be courageous and I'm moving fast. He leads, though, a totally different people than Moses led. The people that Moses led had been born into Egypt but now wandered for 40 years in the wilderness till everybody who was over the age of 20 was dead. So he has a young church, a different church church in a different time in a different way he leads a totally different people he leads them in a totally different way he sends two spies instead of 12 I wonder why maybe because of Joshua and Caleb (laughs) were the only two that came back with a positive report and Israel crosses the Jordan with him but they cross the Jordan not the Red Sea This is the story or the tale of two crossings and two peoples and two times and two types of leadership. This is not a sea. This is a river. It's not like it was 65 years ago today. I love the psalms you sing. Those psalms I grew up on. I know it's the reason my beard is gray when I shave it. But those are the songs I grew up on. I love the songs you sing. Those are the ones that woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. After I lost my son, I love them both. But we got to face the facts. It's a different day, a different river, a different body of water, a different style of people. These people don't know about Egypt. These are just kids. We're kids when they came out of Egypt. They, they They didn't know all of those old stories and brush harbors and all of that and what God did. They're here, they're now, but the promises of God are still theirs and are still before them. He leads them in a totally different way. They cross the Jordan in a totally different way. The old man Moses stands up, waves a rod, prays a prayer, goes to bed, wakes up, and the answer of the Lord's there. Joshua's got a different situation. The river's out of its bank. It's a time of harvest. It's flooding. He's got to lead, he's a, got to lead these people, and how do I do it? And the Lord said, why don't you put the ark in, for, in front? What's he doing? He's hearing from God. Wait a minute. That's not the way Dad did it. That's not the way Moses did it. That's not the way I've seen it done before. But if you'll do what I'm saying to you, I'm leading you into the promises of God. And he says, okay, so tell me what to do. He said, why don't you get that ark that was made in the wilderness? And why don't you put it on the shoulders of the priest? And why don't you put the priest first? And why don't you put some distance between you and them and let them start walking down into the water? The water didn't recede. They didn't have a clear and dry path in the middle of a COVID pandemic used to be really clear what was 
sin and what wasn't, what was black and what was white. We preachers were good at giving lists, and if you've never been in church long enough to remember the list, well, then God love you. Amen. I remember the list. And you do this and you don't do this and you don't do it. It was easy in those days to see the path of God. And now it's a much different day. We've got to walk in the Spirit. We've got to be led in the Spirit. The church has got to be led in the Spirit. You fathers got to lead your homes in the Spirit. You men, you women have got to lead your lives in the Spirit. You've got to follow after the voice of God every single day on your job, in your kid's school, every single way. You better put God first and be looking to what God wants and the direction. He said, you walk them down into the water. Okay, that's what you want. That's what I'm going to do. He gets them started, and they head to the water. This ain't going to look, end up good. Oh, no, Pastor. I've seen this before. I've seen water crossings before. This is not how we do it. This is what God said. Follow the man of God. Do it the way he said he'd do it. And trust that God spoke to him. Trust that he heard from God. Trust that God spoke to him. Trust that he heard from God. And as they stepped into the water, the Bible said when the sole of their feet hit the water, the waters begin to withdraw all the way back up, up down. The waters begin to shut off, and these waters begin to run away. And as they walked into the water, no, it wasn't powder dry like it was in a clear path that was done for them in the night. But now, step by step, they wander down into the bottom of that river, that raging river, and it dries up as they take one step after another until they all walk through on dry ground. It's the tale of two crossings. It's the tale of two peoples. It's the tale of two styles of leadership at different times, but both headed toward the pathway that leads to the promises of God. And God sent me here to this church to tell you if you're going to see the promises God gave to this man fulfilled in your life uh, and in your children's life, you've got to follow the man of God that he's laid his hands upon to lead you. Right now, you need to stand before God right now in this place and talk to God right now. The Holy Ghost is moving. Come, brother, come. The Holy Ghost, move right now. Do not pass this moment. Do not pass this moment. Don't pass it. Come on. God's doing something. He wants to bring, the prom bring you into the promises. He set this church into this community for a reason. You have a place. You have a purpose. Shataliaboshata. And you've got a man of God that's trying to lead you into those promises of power. He's given it everything he's got. He, everything he ever learned, he learned from his father. His songs are different than Moses' songs. They don't sound the same. They don't look the same. They don't walk the same. They don't act the same, but they're both always on the pathway to the promised land, leading this church to the place that God has prepared for it. Are you hungry, church? Are you hungry to see every promise that God ever made to the bishop, to his precious wife come to pass? Right now, lift your hands and tell God, I'm hungry to see the promised land that you've prepared in this community, in this city. I'm ready to see the plan of God that you've set forth. Hallelujah. That you've set forth. If you're in this place today and you're an individual that has never received the promise of God, which is the Holy Ghost, I cannot leave this place today without making a personal appeal to you. You're not here by accident. If you've not received the gift of the Holy Ghost and you know it because you spoke in another tongue in a supernatural fashion as the Spirit of God moved into you, I'm here to tell you all you need to do is to repent of your sins. That means just tell God right now, and I want us all to do that. God, I want to serve you with all of my heart. Come on, everybody in the building, repent with me. I want to serve you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind. 
with all of my strength. Come on, that's the first commandment. Come on, I want to serve you, God. Come on, I don't care who you are, where you come from. If you're in this place right now, you've never received the promise of the Father, the Holy Ghost. Uh, you can receive it right now. Just start telling God that I want to serve you. I'm tired of serving me. Yeah, I should have. I want to serve you. My time is yours. My talent is yours. My treasure is yours. That's what repentance sounds like. Every person in this building, would you repent with me and say, my time is yours, God. My talent is yours, God. My treasure is yours, God. I'm not here for myself. I'm I'm here for you, God. I've got a purpose. If you don't know what your purpose is because you've never received the promise, I will tell you that all you need to do is stir up that gift of God and let it fill you. You'll find what God made you for. Maybe preacher, maybe singer, maybe doorkeeper, maybe servant in the community. I don't know what God had in mind when he made each and every individual, but he knows. Right now, if you're in this place and and you don't have purpose for your life because you don't have the promise, just open your heart right now, lift your hands, and begin to ask God to fill you with His Holy Spirit. And before you leave this place, you can be filled with that promise. It's a gift to you. It's a gift to you from God so that you can find your purpose. In this church, you're not here by accident. You didn't just stumble in here. You're not an arbitrary member of this community. But God has ordered your steps. There is a place in this church for you. There is a place for you. I don't know what your custom is if you're coming to the front now or if you're staying in your pews. I don't know what you do in your state. But whatever you do right now, why don't you do that? If you're hungry for God and you haven't received the Holy Ghost, if you come forward, I'm sure somebody will meet you here and pray for you. Or if you'll just turn to the person beside you or behind you and say, would you help me? Receive the promise of the Father. Somebody will come and stand with you and pray with you right now so that when you leave here today, you'll be filled with power, purpose, and you'll have a place to serve. And if you're here in a part of this church community and you want to fulfill the promises that God has prepared for this church and you're willing to follow the man of God that he's placed over you to lead you to the path, way to the promised land, why don't you come forward if that's your custom? If not, stay where you're at. But the rest of this service is your opportunity to act on what you've heard today. To act on what you've heard today. To act on what you've heard today in this house. And find your path to your promised land.